Welcome. Welcome to Lincoln Square Presbyterian Church's online worship for April 19th, 2020. We gather confessing and trusting that God has called us and that by His Spirit He meets us, even as we are worshiping apart at this time, that His Spirit unites us to Him and to one another. And so we gather and worship anticipating God meeting us and caring for us by His Word and by His Spirit. And as we begin, I just want to take a moment to remind you that when we gather for worship, Christ invites us in his welcome, and he invites us in his generosity. And as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, let's take some time even now to pause the video if you'd like, but to return that welcome by greeting one another if you're worshiping with others, or to send a text or a quick email, or to offer a prayer of peace for somebody at this time. And also Christ meets us with his generosity and that we want to respond generously as well. So I invite you to go to the church's website and you can see a way to give online there. Especially when I highlight the Benevolence Fund. This is a fund the deacons can use to support neighbors and church members in times of need. So you can give gifts to that fund. Or if you have need yourself, please let the church know how we can pray for you or how we can support you at this time. One final announcement that there is a congregational meeting coming up. So LSPC will have a Zoom uh, gathering. It's Wednesday, April 29th at 8 o'clock. If you're interested in that, uh, we'd be great to have you join us. Information's in the church email, or you can contact the church office if you have questions. Well, God has called us in that we come in response to gather as those redeemed by God. So let's take a moment of quiet to prepare ourselves to come and worship. Call the worship today is from Psalm 77, and I invite you to sing along with us at home. You are the God who works wonders. Cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble I seek the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. You are the God who works wonders, let us remember the might of the Lord. You are the God who works wonders, let us remember the might of the Lord. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is 
morning. This is a song that we learned last year during Kids Week. So kids, if you remember, uh, you're welcome to join me. And adults, if it's pretty simple, so if you'd like to join, you can too. <laughs> Jesus told us to love him and to love everyone. Jesus told us to love him and to love everyone. So let your light shine. Today's New Testament lesson is from Acts 2, verses 14 and 22 through 32. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in, through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, may I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. The Gospel lesson is from John 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed him his hand, she, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness, 
if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let's take a moment to pray together. And as I, as I mentioned in past videos, I invite you to take time even to pause the video to kind of check in with yourself and how you're doing. Or if you're worshiping with others, to take a moment to ask each other how they're feeling or how they're doing at this time. I'll lead us in prayer and then have time at the end for our, your own personal t confessions or bring your own needs to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have called us into your presence. We give you thanks for the truth that we are not alone, not on our, on our own to face what's going on inside of us or what's happening around us. And so, Lord, as you call us to come to you, we, we say and acknowledge that these uncertain days of news conferences, of daily updates on the number of sick or those who have passed away, our practice of social distancing and unknown timelines, that in all these things we are tempted to despair, tempted to assume the worst for ourselves or our loved ones or our community, that these things leave us feeling confused and helpless, feeling challenged to know how to respond in a way that is good or helpful. And so, Lord, we ask that you would meet us in our worries and our fears, that you would lead us and guide us. For, Lord, we remember that you have told us that you are the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And so, Lord, it is right for us to turn to you seeking your comfort, to come to you and express that we are weary, that we feel the uncertainty of the future, we wonder and worry about school, about our plans, about opportunities that we were planning on or looking forward to, about our work and our livelihood, about relationships. We miss being together. We miss the rhythms of our life. We miss activities and being productive. So Lord, we come to you, the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort. Lord, meet us in our weariness. Meet us in the, the lament of seeing more of our neighbors become sick or pass away. Lord, we do join the words of Psalm 77, the words from our call to worship, in which we cry to you, God. We cry aloud, trusting that you will hear us. In the day of trouble, we seek you, remembering your deeds, remembering and meditating on your wonders. For what God is like you, God? You are the God who has redeemed your people. When the waters of chaos and trouble saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The deep trembled. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. You led your people like a flock. And so, Lord, we gather and we remember you as the one who redeemed us. In particular, during Easter tide. We remember the resurrection of Christ, that you enter the chaos and the trouble of human sin, human evil, of hurt and sorrow and death. You walked fully into these waters. 
into this darkness and step forth as the risen, glorious Christ. So Lord, let us turn to you for hope and in the promise that as you raise Christ, you too will raise us. We give you thanks for this comfort. And so Lord, we turn to you and we pray for one another and our neighbors. We pray for all those who are sick. We pray for care and healing. We pray for those who are vulnerable at this time. We pray for safety and protection. For those who are experiencing fear and anxiety, we pray for peace, peace of mind by your Spirit. For families who are struggling to live and work and to educate in harmony and in close quarters, we pray for patience and for grace. For essential workers, we pray for their protection and strength. For those who have lost wages or work or don't have adequate health insurance, we pray that no one nor any family would face financial burdens alone. For those who are afraid to access care due to their legal status, we pray for recognition of God's given dignity to all. For our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, we pray for shared solidarity and shared hope. And for public officials and decision makers, we pray for wisdom and guidance. And Lord, in all these things, we pray that the church would be a sign of hope and of love to all. I invite you now to take a moment to bring your own personal needs and confessions to God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it is good to worship together. It's good to see uh, faces of people in the congregation contributing in worship. And it's good to look at God's word together. Uh, in this uncertain time in which our normal schedules are turned upside down, in which we are forced to uh, deal with you know, new circumstances that seem so strange and unusual, one thing that I have found and want to encourage you is that the church calendar can be a source of comfort, a source of time, a source of direction. And so last Sunday, part of the church calendar, we celebrated Easter and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now we are in the season that's called Eastertide. It's a time between Easter and Pentecost. Eastertide is six Sundays, and it's a time for us intentionally to reflect and dwell on the resurrection, on the hope of Easter. So our new sermon series starting today will be a chance to focus on what the resurrection means and how it speaks hope to you and to me. We'll look at a passage from 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning, and in it we'll hear read, according to God's mercy, we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. The resurrection of Christ is a true historic event outside of us that does not depend on us, but it is an event that changes everything, that gives new life to us and for all who are in Christ. It gives hope, a hope that will endure, a hope that continues in all circumstances, a hope that reaches to the very depths of who we are. So let's look at this passage from 1 Peter 1, verse 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, 
and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word given for our good. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have called us and gathered us here by your spirit. And we thank you for your word that is true. The word that points to the incarnate Christ, the word who knew death but was risen to new life. We pray that we would encounter this resurrection today and that it would speak hope to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look through our passage and our sermon, there's three parts to the sermon and there's three phrases that I want us to look at. Elect exiles, living hope, and certain inheritance. Elect exiles, living hope, and a certain inheritance. These three together help us understand the hope of the resurrection. So let's start with that first one, elect exiles. As a way to begin, I want to ask, what are the fundamental features or characteristics of our contemporary society? I'm sure that we could come up with a long list, lots of possibilities to describe our culture or who we are at this time. We might think of technology, we might think of communication, this unheard of access or the abundance of information before us. But another key feature is mobility, our mobility. One can argue that our mobility is perhaps the defining feature of our time. Not only are we used to going from store to store, from appointments to lessons to meetings to classes to work or to school and then home again, but many of us expect to move our households perhaps several times in our lives across the country or even across oceans. This is worth noting because as you know, it is our mobility that is currently and utterly restricted. We're forced to submit to a mobility fast. We're forced to deal with the reality that even basic daily movements from home to office or home to school are on hold. And that we find ourselves, many of us, prizing the short walk around the neighborhood or a trip to the grocery store any time that we can go out of the house. I mentioned this new reality in order to help us understand Peter's context. In contrast to our loss of mobility, Peter describes his audience as exiles of the dispersion. Exiles of the dispersion. In the ancient world, most had a deep connection to a land or a place linked to their family for generations. But now these Christians, those who were receiving Peter's letter, had been forced out of their home, forced from their land or their place to go someplace unknown. Exiles of the dispersion. We don't know all the details, but we do know that Jewish Christians were being scattered from Jerusalem, forced out of their homes by Roman authorities. And the audience of this letter were not simply feeling at odds, but were being mistreated or marginalized due to their faith, marginalized because they were seeking to do good. We, living in a society that is fundamentally mobile, are stuck in one place. Peter, writing to Christians normally set in one location, are now scattered, exiles. Do you see the reverse conditions? They are reverse conditions, but in both circumstances, the, the feelings that come about are to be unsettled. One author describes it as dread, anxiety or fear over what we are now facing or what will await us in the days ahead. Peter's audience shares with us the dread, the dread of uncertainty, 
the dread of being unsettled. Just this week, the governor decided that there's no return to in-class school for this academic year. Here is another example out of a list of examples of our loss, of our sadness, of feeling uncertain or powerless, things being chaotic with no timeline to know when things will return to what has been lost. Exiles of the dispersion. Peter recognizes the circumstances and trials facing his brothers and sisters, but he does not simply write to those who are exiles. Did you hear, did you notice that he doesn't just write to those who are exiles, he writes, you who are elect exiles, elect exiles. Peter is recognizing that they are unsettled and facing unknowns unknown timelines, unknown situation, but he adds a new perspective. There's more than being an exile. There's more than your circumstances or trials. Elect here refers to God's actions for you. Peter reminds them that they belong to the triune God. You are chosen foreigners. Elect exiles. He brings these two realities together, and this identity is described with Trinitarian language. The Father the Son, and the Spirit. Do you see what he wrote? You are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Peter does not define us by our ancestors, our moral background, our professional path or accomplishments, our social or economic status. He does not define us ultimately by our circumstances or those things that trouble us. These do not ultimately define our identity. Rather, in his own initiative, God has acted to make you his child, one of his people. And so our passage invites us, in the face of circumstances that fill us with dread, to remember our fundamental identity in Christ. In Christ, we are what the Greek word here being ekletos, We are the chosen ones of God. Those, even in the face of difficulties, we are those destined in Christ for salvation. Elect exiles. In these opening words, Peter offers a new vision in which we see not only our difficulties, our circumstances, but also the action of God for us. I want us to to see, it's like Peter, by God's word, is, is handing us glasses holding up new lenses to which we can see more fully. Recently, my family, we had some old pictures that we were looking at, and one of my daughters was giving me a hard time about my old glasses and how they looked so kind of old and out of style. Uh, you know, old frames, maybe you can picture that, and pictures of yourself for other people. But however you imagine glasses should be, or however <laughs> you want your glasses to look, However, the picture, the key is the lenses that allow you to see. The key is the lenses that open our eyes in new ways. And so we can, what is this that Peter gives us? What are these lenses that he uses to open our eyes? And the first is that we're reminded that we belong to the triune God. Elect exiles, elect chosen ones that God has acted for us. But another lens that he puts before us is he offers us a blessing a blessing that speaks of the impact of who God is and God's actions for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You see, elect exiles tell us who we are and about hope. But the blessing, the second lens, gives us two other things to help us know who we are. That God gives us new birth, birth to a living hope, and birth into an inheritance that is certain. So the second thing I want us to see is that we have been born again in Christ to a living hope. Living hope is in contrast with hope that is dead. Dead hope is dead. It's dead because it rests on futile things, on fading or transient or insufficient things. 
I imagine that you can relate to me in this, that when we especially are experiencing uncertainty, feeling unsettled, that we are desperate to find anything that would give comfort. That we can turn, seeking comfort, we can turn to places where true comfort cannot be found. Some of our cultural defaults for such comfort or ideas of hope can be material goods, can be our appearance, can be academic or career success, can be physical pleasures, it can be substances that numb ourselves or numbing ourselves through entertainment. All these attempts to try to comfort ourselves, find comfort in the midst of uncertainties. But we have to see that wherever we direct our hope, wherever we give ourselves to a person or to an item, to a resource for success or a gift, anytime we move ourselves towards something for comfort or hope, we're asking that person or that item to carry a weight, to carry a burden. In this way, hope gives the image of a foundation, something that we build upon, something that we rest our security, our future, our dreams, our worries upon. And it's possible that we would put ourselves upon a foundation that is insufficient, where true comfort cannot be found. But here we're invited to know in Christ that a living hope exists. A living hope is a foundation that will not crumble, that will not fade or fall away. And the Christian hope is living because it has faced, hear this, it has faced all threats, even death, yet endured. In Jesus, the risen one, there is hope, living hope, even in the face of mistreatment, of rejection, suffering, and sin and death. For Jesus went through those things and now is the risen one who has endured. The current circumstances leave us wondering about the future. Will things get back to normal? What will the economic impact be? How will we or our children be different? How will we mourn or remember those who are sick or have passed away? Oliver O'Donnell, a Christian ethicist, identifies three ways that we contemplate the future. He says that we contemplate it through anticipation, deliberation, and hope. Anticipation is our natural expectation that we can count on things going on as they have in the past. In the morning, the sun will rise. That's anticipation. Deliberation is when we begin to plan and strategize, put our intentions and actions into the mix. When the sun rises, we'll set out on our trip. When the sun rises, I will make that phone call, send that email, have that important conversation. But hope is different. Hope is different than anticipation or deliberation. Hope is what you need when anticipation and deliberation run out or reach their limits. When you have no reasonable explanation that things will just work out or that you can trust in your own capabilities. The circumstances or obstacles are such that we feel or see our limits. In such times, we might not even know what to hope for. We just know that we need something or someone beyond our own self, beyond our anticipation, and beyond our deliberating. It's in God's mercy that he has caused us in Christ to be born again to a living hope, a hope that meets us and that endures. And it's rooted in Jesus, the one who has risen from the dead. Here is a hope, a power that's beyond us, not rooted in our deliberation, or our capacity. You see, hope is not something that we produce. It's a gift. Living hope is always a gift. It's a gift, yet like love and faith, we must learn to practice this gift, must practice hope. Trusting the God of the resurrection is a virtue, a mark of Christian character. And to grow in hope is to practice not only acknowledging our suffering and our difficulty, but also to look beyond ourselves and our plans toward the true God. And this honest confession of our circumstances, along with confessing God's action for us, is a way of seeing anew. It's a new way of seeing. Elect exiles, 
in which we humbly know the fragility of, of human life in a hostile world, along with the promise of the gospel of grace. Such vision, rooted in Christ, means that there is more than our circumstances and more than our resources. We have to practice remembering that truth. Hope rooted in God's action creates a space for you and me, a space in which we can have humility and honesty, a space even to have courage in the face of uncertainty, or a space for us to grow in neighborly love or selflessness and self-restraint. For our hope, our foundation is in God, not in our accumulation or our holding on to certain things. We have been born again to a living hope. We've also been born again to a certain inheritance. Our third and final phrase, a certain inheritance. Born again says that there is a power, a force that impacts us, that renews us. This is a power outside of us that brings us forth into life. We do not choose to make ourselves become born. And God is using that image again to say that by his power, we being born anew. This is family language. You've been given new birth into a new family. And in this family, we are marked out as those with a living hope, a foundation that endures, a certain inheritance, a certain blessing that no one can take from you in Christ. By God's mercy, we become new people. Being in Christ means that what God did for Jesus on Easter, God will do for us in our spirit And in the last day, this new birth has brought to you a new inheritance, or another way to think about it, a new future, a new future that is certain. And to help us grasp this new future, Peter gives us three words, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's imperishable, meaning it's free from decay or death. It's undefiled meaning it's free from uncleanness or impurity or guilt. It's unfading, meaning it's free from the natural ravages of time. Here is a future. Here is a future giving a gift to you that cannot be touched by time, by circumstances, by enemies, by mistreatment. So what is this inheritance that we have in Christ? We could talk for a long time just about that blessing, but in Christ we have the benefits, the inheritance of being born anew, of no longer being on our own just with our sin and death, but to be born again in Christ, to be in Him, to be adopted by God into His family, to no longer be alone. And we have in this inheritance the promise of forgiveness, the promise of righteousness, the promise of union with God, the renewal of our bodies, the renewal of our relationship in God's family, the glory of God. These are certainties. We will know God face to face, Scripture says, and we will know others as brother and sister, and we will know ourselves and not be ashamed. All sin and evil, all suffering and sorrow, and even death will be put away. This is our certain inheritance. This is our future in Christ, and God keeps it for you. There is a movie from the early 1990s, way back then, a movie called In the Name of the Father. Maybe you've seen it. It's a drama based on a true story in which four people were wrongly convicted of a bombing of an English pub in the 1970s. And two of the four that were wrongly convicted, two of them are a father and son. And they are put in prison because of the conviction. The movie unfolds and the father and son find themselves coping in different ways. The son escapes with drugs and then with vengeance. But the father relies on faith and on remembering. At first, the son is angry and believes the father to be weak to not be fighting for himself. But over the course of the film, the son has a change of heart. And in one particular scene, he says to his father, I don't deserve to spend the rest of my life in here in this prison, do I? And the father tells his son how he has been surviving. Son, all they'd done 
was block out the light. Then he points to his head. They can't block out the light in here. They can't block out the light in here. And he explains to his son every night, I remember what it is like to take your mother's hand in mine. I remember going out the front door into Cypress Street down the Falls Road. I remember going to Cave Hill. I remember looking down at Belfast, our city. I've been doing that every night for five years. You see, the father in his bondage and his unjust circumstances remembers. He's practicing. He's remembering his identity. He's remembering what is true, even though he can't presently see that reality. And certainly the circumstances are different for you and me. But I mentioned that image, that movie, that we might be invited to practice hope ourselves. Hope is a gift in which we are invited to practice seeing things anew. The practice of viewing our life and our circumstances through the lens of God's activity. This means taking seriously our circumstances or whatever we're facing, the struggle within us or what's happening around us and how we are being hurt. But to view those things, those realities through faith by remembering and confessing in Jesus and through his resurrection from the dead that we now and forever have a living hope and a certain inheritance that these things are true, that we remember them even when we can't see them in the present, that we remember and confess that we have an identity as the chosen ones of God in Christ. Peter's audience, those who have been in one place, have been scattered. We who are used to being mobile are stuck in one location. And in these circumstances, there is sorrow and joy. To be faithful followers of Christ does not mean that we're unaffected by sorrow, unafraid of danger, unhurt by harsh things, or untouched by difficult circumstances. We struggle, all of us in Christ even struggle with the dread of uncertainty and the unknown. But in these places, we're invited to see Christ in not just our circumstances, We're reminded that God has acted for us, choosing us, giving us new life in the resurrection, that we can have a living hope and a certain future. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are, and we thank you, Lord, that you meet us where we are. We thank you for the wonder of the gospel that says, not that we come to you, but that you have come to us. We pray that today, that you'd meet us wherever we are, and by your Spirit, you lift our heads in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing along with us at home. The church has waited alone. Her absent Lord to see. And still
Receive now God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forever. Amen.